So good morning, everyone. My name is Valerie Smith, and I'm the director of programs at Parachute Canada. Uh, Parachute is a national charity dedicated to injury prevention, and one of our key strategic priorities is road safety. Uh, very excited about the panel this morning. Um, today we're talking on road safety in lower and middle income countries, uh, and we're going to talk about it as well as it connects to the global decade of action for road safety and the global plan, which we've been hearing a lot about over the last few days of the conference. Um, as we know, the global plan sets out a clear need for collaboration between low middle income countries and high income countries. And this is what brings us to our session today. So we're going to start off with uh, Nika Henry. Uh, Nika is going to present on the United Nations Road Safety Fund for a world where roads are safe for every road users everywhere. Nika Henry has worked with the United Nations for over 15 years, advising on and managing large multi-year international development assistant projects and other initiatives in developing countries. Her work experience spans women's economic empowerment to agricultural sector development to road safety. Nika began serving as head of the United Nations Road Safety Fund Secretariat since May 1st, 2021. Welcome, Nika. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to those listening in the room as well as uh, online. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Enika Henry and I'm the head of the UN Road Safety Fund, which is the operational part of the UN system that is working on improving road safety in low and middle income countries. As many of you probably uh, can appreciate, um, there is a, a significant, very obvious gap uh, in terms of road safety performance between higher income countries, uh, such as Canada, and, and mid low and, low and middle income countries, um, particularly in, in Africa, as well as other parts like Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, you will find that out of every 100,000 population um, in higher income countries, you have around maybe five to six to seven road traffic deaths per 100,000. But when you look at other countries, particularly in, uh, in Africa, you, you will see the numbers uh, climbing up to as high as in the 30s. So there's a huge gap in terms of the actual road safety performance um, in, in higher income versus low income countries. And that's something that is particularly concerning um, to us all, but particularly uh, from the United Nations where one of our biggest mantras is leaving no one behind. And with a gap so wide, we're obviously having an issue with low and middle income countries on this particular topic. And speaking about the UN mantra and our goals, um, we do have in the sustainable development goals, which is the global blueprint for sustainable development. Um, there is a target uh, 3.6 to half the number of road traffic deaths and fatalities uh, by 2030. Right now, we're about 1.35 million deaths per year. So we really want to substantially lower that um, by that, that target uh, year of 2030. So there's a lot of work to be done. And the fund was created with a mindset of, of tackling this. More than 93% of road traffic deaths, so more than 93% of this 1.3 million uh, road traffic deaths are happening in low and middle income countries. So if we're serious about reducing and lowering um, that, uh, that, that number of road traffic deaths, we need to go where the problem really is. And if the bulk of the problem, 93% of it is in low and middle income countries, that's where our focus needs to be. And so when the fund was set up in 2018, we maintained that focus. We moved the discussion from kind of political commitments and the sustainable development goals to advocacy, because now we have a special envoy for road safety, Mr. Jean Todd. Uh, and now really moving into action, which is what the fund, the fund is doing. So after, um, after four years, we now have 25 road safety projects in 30, 30 countries, and it's all across the globe. We're talking about from Afghanistan to Lao PDR, Colombia, Philippines, to you know, Zambia and Ethiopia, uh, Guinea and so forth. So really trying to uh, respect the global mandate of the UN, focusing on low and middle income countries. What we are doing is really trying to move uh, tra a transfer of international standards, expertise, um, best practices, moving that, shifting that to low and middle income countries so that they can be supported in their journey on improving road safety. 
low and middle income country, the governments are not sitting down waiting for the magic to happen. They are working on the agenda, but the reality is that there are capacity gaps that exist um, and that needs to be worked on urgently. And that's where the fund come in, comes in. So is the legislation in place around drink driving or speeding? Are traffic enforcement officers understanding how to go about the most effective way of doing their jobs? Are people being advocated on to wear their helmets and their seat belts? Um, you know, do we have standards around used vehicles that are operating on, on the roads? Are we just taking any, any old crappy car and letting that go on the road? Um, looking at issues around school zones, are urban planners understanding what is the science behind having a safe school zone, one that is protecting the kids, but also allowing multimodal transport, so cars and walking and cycling. So there's lots of um, very expert-based, evidence-based uh, kind of knowledge that a lot of countries, particularly higher income countries, have gone through that path, that journey, and there are lots of lessons learned, and we're trying to get a lot of that over to the developing countries. Questions are coming to me, even from ministers of transport, minister of infrastructure. How do we do this? Where do we start? And a lot of this has already been tested and tried in higher income countries, and we're not trying to make it difficult for low and middle income countries to access that information. We're trying to make it easy. And that's where the fund comes in with its projects, um, its capacity development projects. So this is, this is pretty much where um, the nutshell of where the fund is at. Um, but against this backdrop, um, you know, there is this, uh, I've just been speaking at the FIA Foundation 20 year anniversary where they're talking about designing for life. Um, and I think that's, that's a very important um, part of where the fund comes in as well, because this partnership, it's not just, um, you know, UN agencies, which is important, but we also have multilateral development banks that are part of this partnership. We have NGOs, which is part of this partnership. We have governments from both the higher income and lower income countries that are part of this partnership. So it's how do we come together to address not just road safety in a very siloed way, but how do we design this issue of road and road safety in a way that is for life. And, and that means bringing in um, a, the context that we are working with climate crisis, health crisis, we have geopolitical crisis. And against this backdrop, we have a real chance to make important progress towards achieving an important piece of the 2030 global development agenda, which is the safe and sustainable mobility. It's not just safety, but also sustainability. And, this is a chance that we can't afford to, to ignore. Uh, road, road crashes are killing 1.35 million a year. It's the number one cause of death for kids above five years old and youth below 29. Um, so, you know, safe roads are really this, this critical enabler of healthy lives, uh, but also you can logically think about it being also about equitable access to education and to, to jobs and to the shops and. So how do we um, you know, build this agenda around road safety, um, this safe and sustainable mobility? And this is what our projects are tackling. So it's not just how do you build a road, but how do you build a road knowing that there will be children who cross it a lot to get to school? How do you build a road knowing that we wanna promote cycling? So this issue of green mobility is something that we think about um, a lot in our projects as well. So we talk about well-being, uh, health and well-being, but also quality of life. So we look at how our projects can touch some of these, um, these other development uh, priorities. Uh, mobility challenges uh, that are being faced by low and middle income countries also are pushing against the, the climate uh, story, the climate crisis. You know, I talked about used vehicles before and we actually have a very um, interesting project in West Africa around used vehicles and having harmonized standards for the used vehicles that are being imported into West Africa wanting to improve those standards. When you think about things like, you know, worsening congestion and air pollution, um, you wanna think about the safer a car is, it can be linked to its age. And also the younger the car is, you can imagine that it will have better, you know, um, uh, fuel filters and your safety belt. So you get that twinning of safe mobility, but also sustainable mobility when you think about issues like um, the vehicles that are on the road. Um, so th these are some of the things that we're looking at at the UN Road Safety Fund. And um, I think it's good for you to realize, especially coming from an audience, um, mostly Canadian, that the role of higher income countries 
it's great to have you know that development assistance and that financing it's absolutely critical because it doesn't happen by magic so we need more funding to do more projects um, in the first phase we had between 2018 to 2021 the first phase of the fund we had over 100 million dollars worth of um, projects proposals being submitted to us that's that's the level at which people wanted to be supported but the fund only had in the piggy bank um, 20 million so of course there is a huge um, um, mismatch in terms of what the needs are and the expectations are for support versus what is being provided and what's available and so Ramping up financing is something that, of course, development um, actors in high income countries can play a, a strong role there. But I think it's important to note it's not just about the financing. As I said, there are lots of great initiatives happening in higher income countries that have worked, that have failed, that have worked. And all of these lessons can be transmitted to lower income countries so that they don't make the same mistakes, but they can benefit and leapfrog from the successes that, that, that um, other countries have enjoyed. Um, and so I think part of the partnership is also about having those conversations and that knowledge sharing. And that's why last year I instituted uh, this platforms for engagement, which is a possibility for stakeholders from high income countries, low income countries, private sector, public sector to really share information about what is working and how it can work better for other countries. Um, so this is, a, I think, a particularly interesting role and space for for Canadian actors, whether you're from the government or from civil society or academia, to, to jump into those conversations that we're having at the fund to see how we can get some of that knowledge sharing going outside of you know, just um, hardcore financing. So I think with this, um, perhaps I will uh, stop and, um, and, and, and hand it back over to you, Valerie. Thank you so much, Nika. That was really interesting. And absolutely, uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about the fund. Um, Mavis and I have been chatting about potential opportunities that might exist uh, moving forward between countries like Canada and low and middle income countries around the global plan. So we've got some really great energy uh, happening in Canada with some of our road safety professionals. Uh, so really looking forward to, to next steps and discussions. Um, I'll also just touch on the fact that um, I spent many years working in Latin America, uh, Tanzania, Ethiopia. Um, and so this topic is, is very, very interesting to me and uh, very close to, to my heart. So thank you very much, Nika. Uh, our next speaker is Chika Sakushita. Uh, she will be speaking on how NGOs can help to um, achieve reductions in injury and death in low and middle income countries. Um, Chika is the Director of Research and Accountability at the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety. Uh, she leads the strategic planning and delivery of research that informs advocacy, develops NGO capacity, and strength, strengthens the accountability for road safety delivery. Chika brings a wealth of experience in road safety delivery in government, academia, NGO advocacy, as well as independent consulting to multiple international organizations and governments. Prior to joining the Alliance Secretary in October 2021, Chica made significant contributions to the Alliance's work, The Day Our World Crumbled, The Human Cost of Inaction on Road Safety, as well as the Good Practice Guide, Meaningful NGO Participation. Thank you, Chica, and over to you. Thank you very much, Valerie, and, um, and thank you to the CASP or conference organizers. Um, I had the privilege to um, also present on the first day um, to step in for a lot of who was stuck in a um, transport strike. Um, and uh, it, it's a fantastic conference so far and, um, and really glad to be um, here. Um, though I could not be in person, um, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to join you online. So um, this session is focused on LMICs, low middle income countries. Um, so I thought we'd um, share uh, some of the work that we are doing in LMICs and um, specifically in Africa. Um, so I'll share my um, screen. So, um, sorry, I'll, if you yes? can put it on to full screen. Oh, sorry, yes. No problem. Is that all right? Perfect, thank you. Great, okay. So, um, so I'll, cover what, what the snapshot of road safety in Africa is as a region. Um, some of you may already be familiar. 
um, and then move on to the how how NGOs are calling to action to deliver the global plan that we've been hearing a lot about during this conference and how the NGOs are um, helping to build evidence to strengthen our advocacy and our NGO influence in Africa. So the reason um, I thought I'd focus on Africa is um, because the session is on low middle income countries. <laughs> and this is a map that shows um, the income level of various no, countries I, around yeah, the world. Like oh, sorry, I'm getting conflicting okay, it's very hot. sound yeah. in the background. Sorry, can... Balance. Sorry, Brent. Uh, Nika. Okay. Do you wanna? Do you wanna speak to it? Hi, Nika. I think you're you're connected twice. I saw earlier. Well, maybe maybe it's gone, but just really? yeah. I think we're there's getting another screen. Hmm. Um, this oh well. <laughs> I, can you hear me? Okay, from your end. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. we, get, we right. get that other voice too, and I'm not quite sure who it is. <laughs> Try to get <laughs> okay. rid of it. You jock. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sorry about that. That's on. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, so the purple is showing the low income and the lower middle income countries, and you can see that it's very much concentrated in Africa. And um, this is mo mostly based on the WHO Global Status Report. Um, the latest being in 2018. Um, there's a new one coming up 2023, I, I believe. Um, this graph on the left, um, it shows the various regions of WHO. Um, the very um, left one, the lowest bar, this is the death rate per thousand population. And as Nika said, um, in the high income countries, um, they tend to be around five to seven, and the Europe region um, has the lowest around the world, and Africa being at the other end, be having the highest rate of um, death from road crashes at around 27, and some are higher than 30 per 100,000 population, as Anika has highlighted. Um, and the, this graph on the right, um, it shows the um, change between the two last um, global status report. So what have we improved over time um, in terms of death reductions? And as you can see, um, the bars have not really moved down compared to the, so the lighter green should have moved down compared to the darker green one. Um, we did have a um, global target of 50% reduction in the last decade as well. But instead of seeing a um, seeing 50% reduction, um, we are we have seen actually increases in some of the regions and Africa being one of them. It has increased in terms of death rates. In this graph, um, it's the one of the other striking thing is that um, this graph shows the the vehicle rate, the registered vehicle rate per population, and you see that Europe has the highest motorization rate and Africa has the lowest. Yet when we look at the death rate, Africa is at the top and Europe is um, around the um, is is doing, you know doing the best compared to, um, to various regions. So th this again highlights, um, as we see, that ninety three percent of the global deaths are concentrated in low middle income countries, and this is um, uh, deeply concerning, and we need to address it. Um, and some of the, what are some of the reasons why this is happening? Um, this is again coming from the WHO data. They look at um, certain laws um, and compare um, which countries meet the, the good practice law. So in terms of drink driving, speed limit laws, child seat, child restraint laws, seat belt laws, helmet law, and key vehicle standards and how many countries um, are meeting the good practice law that um, according to the WHO. And you'll see that there's about 41 countries in Africa and only one meets this in, in drink driving, seven in speed limit, one in child seat and et cetera. And seat belt, they're, I mean, it's, it's one of the better ones, but still out of 41, that's still very low. And there's none in terms of vehicle standards. Um, and, and as Nika has sort of alluded to, there's a lot of um, old um, cars being imported into Africa, 
which are the ones that do not have that um, star ratings or the um, and they, they tend to drive cars that are older and less safe. And th so these are the, some of the reasons why we are seeing a lot more deaths um, being suffered in um, Africa. And we also know, I think most of us, that um, more than half of our deaths around the world are vulnerable road users, pedestrians, um, cyclists, and motorcyclists. And this is very much true in Africa. And especially in Africa, uh, most of the people, um, most of the ways people move around is actually walking. Um, and so not just looking at the pedestrian death rate, but also in terms of the travel demand, that is pedestrians, um, the infrastructure is really not um, set up to meet those needs of the pedestrians um, and let, let alone keeping them safe while they travel. So vulnerable road user death um, interventions is, is um, one of the key priorities to reduce deaths and injuries in Africa. And I think um, many of us are starting to uh, really hear more and more about safe and sustainable transport. And I think given that the world is really um, challenged by multiple um, issues, um, in, including road safety as a, as a global health crisis, um, and climate change and air quality, et cetera, we really need to start thinking about what are the interventions that we can prioritize that will produce co-benefits to all these um, global challenges. And one of the, um, the key ways to produce a safe and sustainable transport is thinking about um, developing cities uh, that are more walkable, cyclable, and catch um, public transport. Um, and moving away from no, um, motorized transport um, or personal vehicle travel to um, public transport, walking and cycling. And they will not only have that safety benefit, but also in terms of climate change and, and it creates more equitable access to, to mobility. Um, and lower speed limits is one of the key ways. Um, we know speed is, is the major fundamental killer of road safety. It's, it's that um, energy that, um, that Nan on the first day has really talked about as well. Uh, that's that's sort of the um, enemy, and uh, and you know we physical bodies are are simply vulnerable, and and we are also humans who make errors, and so lowering speed limits is one of the lowest cost intervention that we can provide, um, and we you will be hit. You would have heard from a lot of our NGOs um, advocating for thirty k or lower, and all these um, sort of promote the other. Um, aspects like um, uh, more integrated public transport in our everyday lives. And the other um, thing to think about and why this is um, road safety in investment is so important. So we hear from some of the low middle income countries that they say, well, we'll address road safety when we become a high income country. And so they think that it, it, um, we tend to think that, oh, we'll wait until there's an economic growth and then we'll see to road safety. Um, and, you, and a lot of the um, GDP uh, narrative is around how much road safety costs the GDP. But road, the World Bank has done a quite a sophisticated analysis where they've shown that if we achieve the halving the road de debts and injuries, then it actually contributes to economic growth. So instead of thinking about, I'll wait until my country becomes a high income country. Well, if you invest in road safety, it actually will help you become a high income country. It's, a, it's, a, a road, it's an investment um, opportunity um, for, for um, low middle income countries. And this is why um, it, it should be a priority for many low middle income countries to address road safety. Um, and you may, as you may have heard on the first day, um, we are the Alliance is committed to the global plan as a, many other partners. And in response to this global plan, um, we've done some reflections and, um, and we've highlighted key things that we really need uh, to do more of in this coming decade to ensure that we can achieve this 50% reduction, um, at least in this decade. 
So um, evidence-based in interventions, obviously um, starting with 30K because th those are the kind of interventions that are going to actually deliver the death and inj injury reduction um, results that we're seeking. And the money is the means to get there. And without the funding, it's, 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 um, it's empty promises. And so we really need the funding. And we also need to make sure that when there is funding, it goes to the right place. That is the evidence-based interventions. And we are seeing that, um, in, especially in low middle income countries and Africa, including Africa, that there is not much NGO space in the decision-making. And so we're calling for NGO involvement in decision-making so that the needs of the people are, are um, considered um, more carefully in, in the decision-making process. So the Alliance is leading um, two research projects um, currently um, as a way to build evidence to strengthen the NGO advocacy as well as influence. And one of the projects that we're working on, um, with big thanks to the funding from Global Road Safety Facility and UK Aid, is assessing the 30K urban zones um, in um, specifically in three African cities, um, in Douala in Cameroon and Nairobi in Kenya and um, Kigali in Rwanda. And what we um, are doing is that we are partnering with our road safety NGOs in each of those cities, um, ASSERT in Kenya and Healthy People Rwanda and Cameroon Road Safety Foundation. And they are collecting the data locally. Um, they have identified um, 30K sites. So actually 30K sites do exist in, in Africa, and but they, they're often like hitting sign or is, is the sign's been posted, but no one has taken notice. And, and so the implementation is still uh, weak. So we want to get a better understanding to really inform a more um, community um, evidence-based um, advocacy messages. So we have identified 30K sites that do exist in the three um, capital cities of the countries and, um, and looking back. So what are the infrastructure features? Um, uh, what, what, what are there, are there pedestrian facilities around it? Are there traffic calming measures to support the 30K? Um, we're also going to be interviewing with the government stakeholders and find out what led to um, putting a 30K sign there. What were the enabling factors that made that area 30? Um, and, uh, and also uh, do focus group discussions with the community members to see what their views are about 30K and um, what they think about the 30K and what, what is their experience in using those 30K zones. And we're hoping that that kind of information, the locally um, generated information will help us um, build a more powerful advocacy message. Um, and hopefully we can see much wider um, implementation of 30K zones in Africa, which is very much needed as we saw in uh, the, the majority of um, people who are uh, commuting or uh, using the roads are pedestrians and the pedestrians are the ones that are suffering most of the deaths. The other project is um, about the a NGO meaningful participation. So as I've alluded, um, NGOs are not really being engaged in the decision-making, especially in Africa. And so in this project, what we're trying to understand is what is the operational environment for NGOs in Africa? And so sp specifically, we're going to be um, working in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Zambia, and trying to understand the, the legal framework um, uh, and, and the relationships between NGO and governments, what are the hampering factors or uh, the barriers for NGOs to be able to work more closely with governments? And again, we are working with um, local partners, um, with uh, universities actually um, in Zambia and Ethiopia and Uganda. And we will um, conduct um, in-depth interviews with governments in each of these countries, as well as surveys with um, NGOs to, so that we can better understand what is their experience of um, NGOs working with government, but also understand from the government perspective, what is it that uh, do, do they actually involve, think of involving NGOs? And if so, why, if not, why? So we can understand more and hopefully create a more of a better framework to assist um, uh, strengthening that NGO government relationship to deliver road safety um, in these African countries. So 
that is the snapshot um, of what we are doing and I'm happy to answer any questions towards the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chika. Um, yeah, and I just want to take a minute to thank you, Chika, and also to thank the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety. I know that in Canada, uh, we've really been looking to you guys for leadership. Um, Latte and the rest of the team have been amazing in terms of uh, leading us and uh, teaching us about the global decade and the global plan. So we really appreciate your efforts. Okay, so um, we are going to move on to our final presenter, um, Mavis Johnson. And sorry, can you pass me this file? Okay. I've lost Mavis's bio. Okay, here we are. So Mavis Johnson, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Mavis on the CARS board for a number of years. Um, Mavis Johnson was the founder and president of the Canadian Traffic Safety Institute. She has been involved in road safety in the UK and Canada for over 50 years. She continues to take a leadership role in road safety across Canada and has been actively involved in developing integrated road safety strategies in several cities and provinces. Her major focus in, is on strategic road safety planning and effective implementation through the safe system approach. In addition, she has practical experience in community engagement and stakeholder consultation. Mavis has knowledge and expertise in all areas within the decade of action for road safety, and she understands the importance of all the components working harmoniously to deliver positive road safety outcomes. Currently, Mavis is involved in a variety of international programs in low and middle income countries in Canada. And uh, we are going to hear from Mavis about her work uh, in road safety in Belize. Welcome, Mavis. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I'm sorry that my co-presenters were uh, not able to uh, be here in person, but uh, uh, we'll certainly continue the discussion between us after I have finished my presentation. Um, we actually had um, two other presenters that should have been presenting uh, here, and uh, unfortunately they were international um, uh, residents and were, weren't able to get the uh, appropriate uh, visas to get into Canada. So I was sort of um, uh, the pinch hitter and came in at the last minute. But it's not very difficult for me to talk about the Belize Road Safety Project. And so, in fact, uh, for more, and many of you that were in the Calgary at our conference uh, in uh, 2019, we actually had um, Ms. Hyde, who was the CEO from the Ministry of Economic Development, and uh, Ms. Pam, who as, uh, was the project manager, we had them both um, in Calgary, and I know they talked a lot and got a lot of interest from, uh, from the other attendees there. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about where Belize is, um, and some of you may might have been, it's just a, a beautiful country to visit, um, but um, it's actually uh, just south of Mexico, it's on the Caribbean Sea, um, it isn't a very large landmass, um, and um, this is a presentation actually that we gave at the a World um, Conference in Seoul a couple, uh, three or four years ago, um, the population then was 360 and right now we're just below 500,000 population. Uh, but there are a lot of the other information is still the same. There are still many major safety deficiencies, but uh, we have made some progress. And uh, of the 15 agencies that are responsible for road safety, uh, we certainly have a lot more uh, cooperation and, and harmonization than we used to. I'm sorry. Um, 
The problem is that uh, traffic crashes are the fourth leading cause of death in, uh, in Belize and uh, with a death rate of 24 per 100,000 population. It actually had been a lot higher than that. And at the time that we presented this uh, earlier report, it actually had the highest death rate from road traffic crashes in all the um, Caribbean nations. And so that was really why the um, Caribbean Development Bank um, started to put some emphasis into road safety and used this small country of Belize as its uh, demonstration country. Uh, most of the fatalities are men um, and, um, and it is a young driver population generally. And the impact as um, Atiku was just uh, talking about the, the impact on the GDP um, again is about uh, 1.26. So it, it, is, um, it is a concern. And in fact, it was, it was because of the uh, impact that traffic crashes have, uh, particularly on economic development, that the management for road safety as the lead organization within the country is the Ministry of Economic Development. In most countries that I've worked in, the lead is either the Ministry of Transport or Infrastructure, or in some cases, uh, the National Police. Um, but the Ministry of Economic Development recognizes the importance of and uh, impact that traffic crashes have uh, on, their, uh, on their economy. Uh, they're also not responsible for any of the implementations but what they have done is formed uh, coalitions so that they um, can follow at least uh, the, or can um, guide those um, government ministries and other organizations that do have a responsibility. And they are all accountable back to the um, Ministry of Economic Development. So how we got started. I'm sorry, this technology, I'm used to just pressing a button here. No, okay, no. okay. Um, so um, in 2011, um, I was selected um, by the Caribbean Development Bank and the government of Belize to undertake a road safety management capacity review, which is a process that uh, the World Bank uh, uh, Global Road Safety Facility started for consultants and, and others to go to countries to assess where the road safety, where road safety is in that country. Um, I mean, it makes sense that if, especially um, funders like um, the World Bank, if they're going to invest in road infrastructure projects, then they want to make sure that there is some level of road safety that's going to uh, be there as a support for any new road infrastructure projects. And in fact, again, this is a feather in the cap of the Caribbean Development Bank because IRAP, the International Road Assessment Program, they actually um, take video and assess through driving through different corridors, they assess the risk on the road. This, this is the organization that uh, identifies the star rating system for roads. So five star ratings are like the best roads that there are and one star ratings are, are the worst type of roads. And in fact, nearly all the roads in, uh, well, lots throughout the Caribbean are one star roads. And so together, um, the, the consultant did that work and myself uh, came up with some recommendations for a workshop that was held after our um, um, work had finished. And um, the workshop, um, came to the conclusion that, first of all, we needed to um, employ some sort of an integrated uh, road safety program, um, including all aspects of road safety, and that um, the improvement of the roads should be prioritized based on the system that IRAP had um, demonstrated. And so after this workshop, um, the selection of the demonstration corridor was vital because we actually focused on the worst corridor in Belize. And it's interesting because this um, high crash corridor was sort of a man-made situation. 
Belize is right on the coast on the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic, and they have torrential um, hurricanes, windstorms, and rain. And um, Belize City, which is on the coast, used to be the capital, but it often got kept getting washed away um, during these uh, dreadful storms. So they moved the, um, the center of the capital of uh, Belize to a place called Belmopan. <coughs> which is 50 miles inland from the coast. But now many of the people who live in Belize city who work for the government and many do, they ride this road all the time. And so it is a very, very busy corridor. Uh, and as I say, if they'd been working in, uh, in Belize City, this wouldn't have happened. However, the project manager and, uh, was appointed, um, a very confident, competent uh, project manager. And uh, I was appointed as the International Road Safety Consultant to the project. Uh, we had a formal launch in 2013. It was a five-year project. We completed it in, um, in um, 2018, and it was a very successful project. I'll tell you a little bit about how successful it was, uh, but uh, immediately the uh, Caribbean Development Bank and the government of Belize uh, chose to go on with a second Belize road safety project, um, which went on to the second priority highway. Um, as with the, um, the last decade of action, but the, they haven't changed, only the terminology's changed. Um, we don't have pillars anymore, but we still do have these priority activities of road safety management, uh, post-crash response, um, safe road users, safe vehicles, and um, safe mobility and safe speeds. And so we had, um, uh, we addressed all those and um, I'm just going to run quickly through um, each of them and talk about what some of the successes were. In road safety management, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, Ministry of Economic Development um, was the lead um, on the project. And uh, the project management unit uh, uh, built an office and a team of, uh, of local people. And um, also identified were specific international consultancies who came to give us uh, advice on good practice in um, traffic enforcement, how to handle um, traffic uh, crashes, and also um, to build um, road safety into the school curriculum. Um, in all of the component parts, uh, we established technical working groups and these were actually the, um, the, the people from each of the ministries and the other organizations that were linked together, uh, like the data collection. We have got four sets of agencies collecting data in Belize. So it was in, important to get these people together so that we can now present um, a, co a, a, a coordinated um, data system. We, collect data on a lot of things, and, um, uh, but it's, it isn't the responsibility of only one organization. There are four of them that make that, uh, that do that. There were several procurements uh, for equipment. The police were given equipment. Uh, we bought them breathalyzer units and speed guns uh, where they had none. And in fact, in the second uh, project, we've provided more uh, equipment for those people. We established a National Road Safety Committee, and that uh, really looks after all of the um, government ministries that have uh, a role to play in road safety, plus uh, some NGOs in the, in the country, and a couple of big businesses that were been supporting uh, the project, including the um, Belize Insurance Company. And it was also important to establish an operational steering committee. The National Road Safety Committee is a high level committee and they only meet twice a year, but it is, um, uh, it does report to cabinet. So it is a high level uh, committee. The operational steering committee is more involved in the day-to-day -day operations of how the work is being done on the pilot, uh, pilot corridor. 
So um, the people that are on that represent the Department of Transport, the Ministry of Health, Department of Infrastructure, the Ministry of Education, um, the Belize Police. And so they're actually overseeing the, um, the, the day-to-day -day management of this second uh, road safety project. Just some of the highlights uh, in road user safety. Um, there are th really three components to road user safety. Uh, one is education and training. That was about what we did for the teachers. The second is uh, communications and awareness. And the third is um, police enforcement. And so um, I'm not going to read all of these out. Uh, we just, um, we, each of the component parts had some expectations of what they were going to deliver. And I have to say that in all areas of the plan, we exceeded, exceeded uh, what we actually had planned to do, which is very good news. So uh, we do have um, curriculum established um, in the school, and uh, we have done training for teachers and provided them with the tools to actually um, teach road safety in schools. And um, the second part, part of that is on the communication and awareness. Uh, we did uh, pre-CAP surveys and post-CAP surveys. And um, uh, we did uh, campaigns. Uh, they have a great um, Facebook page, which uh, is a big social media campaign overall. Um, so there's a lot of communication going on for road users. And um, And then the third thing is um, just thank you. Okay, um, as as I say, we did uh, provide equipment and training uh, for the uh, the police to use. So um, I'm actually going to fast forward through the next slides. You will see them when you see the package um, come to you, but. Uh, in post-crash response, we provided some ambulances and we provided also a lot of basic first aid training. We did some training for um, emergency medical technicians uh, so that the people would know what to do. For the roads, there was a huge amount of work to be done on the roads. And um, we, I'll just show you some pictures before and after. There didn't used to be any lane markings at all. At night, it was just a big open dark space but uh, we've ha had really good results uh, on, uh, especially since we targeted um, the, if you like, collision black spots and collision uh, a segment, high collision segments on the, on the highways. But we've had, and we put pedestrian facilities in where it was appropriate, particularly near schools and villages. Um, we had no markings and we had no guardrail. As part of the um, first project, we also developed this National Road Safety Master Plan, which takes us to 2030. And before um, the new decade of action for road safety started, we had already established our uh, target of vision towards zero deaths, uh, that we would uh, uh, reach 50% reduction in uh, uh, fatalities and serious injuries by 2030. And on the very first corridor, we also had a target to reduce deaths by 30% on that demonstration corridor. And we actually reached that into in year three of the project. So it was very successful. The long-term plan calls for um, the, all the ministries that are involved in the project to develop operational plans. And we broke the plans down into um, short-term, medium, and long-term. Uh, plans. So each government ministry and nine municipalities all uh, um, completed their uh, road safety uh, plan for their municipality. And this is what's significant is that in the results, uh, we actually, if you compared the number of fatalities over time, over years, the, the collisions on the corridor um, had huge reductions where the others uh, the other corridors just had a, a short reduction because there's some crossover on things like all the campaigns and national in scope and uh, 
but generally um, the the success of the project was uh, was demonstrated in everything that we did. Um, this uh, project won um, many awards, including the Prince Michael of Kent International Road Safety Award. And what lessons did we learn? Well, having a champion is really key. And in fact, our champion came from the CEO in the Ministry of Education, uh, Economic Development. We built partnerships and collaboration and harmonization. And uh, we did peer education and a lot of capacity building. Um, it's an integrated approach and you really do need that. Uh, and uh, the connection between all the line ministries and the municipalities. And it's so important, and I'll just touch on this if I can take one more minute, because it will segue into our next section, is that there is sustainable funding provided. So where are we now? Well, we just had two years of, um, of uh, our no going anywhere. And so it, uh, Belize was severely uh, impacted as were many other uh, lower and middle income countries. And so, um, in, um, there were there were no meetings at all. Uh, I did I was um, holding meetings and some training programs, some capacity building with different groups uh, throughout the last two years. But last week um, was my first trip back to Belize, and the first thing that we did I wanted to show you this picture because these are the five CEOs. Person in the middle is the new CEO in the um, Ministry of Economic Development. This two years was significant in Belize, not only for because of COVID, but they also went through uh, national elections. There was wholesale, ch wholesale change in government, and they also dictate a lot about who's also in charge at the ministries, as the CEOs, as the staff, as the mayors in, in, uh, in communities. So um, <clears throat> I only saw about three people that I actually had worked with before in the first project when we were there last week. But what we started with last week was a proclamation. Uh, the proclamation was uh, developed uh, based on the, uh, the uh, global um, road safety plan. So the minister, uh, the CEO in the ministry, um, launched this proclamation. And these five key uh, CEOs in the supporting ministries all signed this as a pledge. And it was, it was like a recommitment because we're not starting from nothing. We have come a long way since 2013. And so we're not starting with nothing. There is a foundation, but there's a lot of um, uh, capacity building to be done. So um, this is my last uh, comment. And that is that some of the challenges, not all always um, sunshine and roses in belief, um, there are some challenges, as there have been in other co countries that I've worked in. And, and one is sustainable funding. We have huge challenges, especially um, in a lot of the funding agencies, whether it's the World Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, International um, American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank. They're all project-based. And so once you've finished your project, you really have to be working on the next generation of the project to get funding. Sustainable funding is a project, is, a, is an issue. But sustainability in general is, if we think about the experience that we've just been through, is how do we make these projects sustainable? How do we continue to provide them with capacity building, uh, which is in, in great need? And, and that's what um, we hope we might be able to have a discussion about now. Um, I was, nearly every time I've been to um, Belize and some other countries, there always seem to have been groups of people from churches on the plains that are going to build schools and build playgrounds and um, build market centers and do all sorts of things. And these are volunteers. And um, I asked the or recommended or suggested to the CARS board a couple of years ago that I think this is something Kars could do. I think we do, we could get volunteers. There may be people who are interested in sharing their knowledge uh, with people in low middle income countries. And so I'm going to hand it over now to um, 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 <laughs> Valerie, who's actually going to um, lead us on a bit of a conversation about how we might do this. 
Yeah, and I, I think this will be about a two minute conversation, unfortunately, because of our, our timing. Um, but I might just um, go right to a question for Nika that connects a little bit to what Mavis said. Um, so in Canada, if, if there is uh, an appetite from uh, say some professionals within KARSP um, to collaborate and work with a group in a low income country, uh, perhaps that someone else has worked with previously, a group in, in say Ethiopia uh, that's working in transport. Is this the type of initiative that uh, the UN fund would be able to support some type of collaboration between a Canadian association and an association in a low income country? Uh, so if you can just give us a, a little bit of insight into the parameters of the fund, then that will help us have a further discussion in Canada. Thanks for the question. So uh, the, the modality in which the fund provides financing, it's through call for proposals. So essentially we open the call for three months and then uh, we invite partners to work collaboratively on ideas uh, to support governments on their road safety journey. Uh, so this is how uh, stakeholders in Canada could, could join in on, on implementing um, fund uh, projects. We actually have a call ongoing right now, but it closes in a couple of days on the 30th of June. Um, and um, we, we have on our page ways that you can engage with our, our main implementing partners, which are different partners in the UN system. So you reach out to them to see if, if you can pitch an idea that could be supportive to the government efforts um, on road safety. There could be a second bite at the cherry, so to speak, in the sense that, um, once we do receive all the proposals, uh, we will be screening them with a panel of road safety experts and ranking them according to the criteria in the call. Um, and once we select uh, the proposals that we, we think are interesting based on the ranking, uh, there will be a sort of an information session. It's not really the best word for it, but it's a session where the road safety experts will help us to identify stakeholders who have experience on that particular type of project initiative in that particular country or region, for example. And there, if stakeholders in Canada have been very active in doing something on road safety, you know, road audits or something in Latin America, they would probably come up um, in, our, in our kind of desk review in terms of who are key stakeholders to consult on the project. And there we would invite them for a conversation and that could be an opportunity to engage as well. Okay, wonderful. Yep. Yeah. So we'll keep our eye out on those uh, call. So forms. just check out the website, call for proposals, and just uh, find out the details there. It's closing on the 30th of June, so it's a good time to check it out. Excellent. Thank you for that. Any questions from the audience before we wrap up? Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, everyone. And um, yeah, really appreciate your insight into, into this discussion. And I definitely do think there's some people here uh, at the conference who are interested in uh, supporting this part of the global plan. So uh, thank you again to all our presenters and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you, bye. Thanks so much, take care, bye-bye. Thanks Nika, bye-bye Chica. Bye Chica.